Thank you for joining us today for another presentation of Let the Bible Speak with your speaker, Brett Hickey. Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words can never hurt me. It's been over 40, 45 years since I've heard that childhood response to name calling. It seemed mildly effective in my youth, but the reality is that verbal abuse can leave longer lasting scars than physical abuse. These truths may even be more painful when they're associated with our faith as Christians. Jesus addressed this concern and encouraged us to put this threat in perspective. Matthew 5, verse 11, Blessed are you when they revile or speak abusively to you and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Jesus prepared us. He wanted us to know that in living the Christian life, not everyone would appreciate us. But instead, if we commit ourselves to doing his will, we would subject ourselves to tongue lashing of various sorts. The greater source of concern, Jesus says, is actually when everyone has only good to say about you. This is a red flag. Luke 6, 26. Woe to you when all men speak well of you, for so did their fathers to the false prophets. Those who speak the truth, preach the truth, and live the truth uncompromisingly become a target for wicked and unprincipled men and women around us. The Apostle Peter elaborated further on the challenge of enduring evil speaking and how to keep it perspective in 1 Peter chapter 4, beginning with verse 13. Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you as though some strange thing happened to you. But rejoice to the extent that you are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory is revealed, you may also be glad with exceeding joy. If you are reproached for the name of Christ, blessed are you, for the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. On their part, he is blasphemed, but on your part, he is glorified. But let none of you suffer as a murderer, a thief, evildoer, or as a busybody in other people's matters. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in this matter. For Christians to understand how vulnerable they may be to criticism, it's helpful to read about what the first century church endured in this area. There's no better place to go to sample this abuse than the book of Acts. And we'll begin there after our song.
When the apostles miraculously spoke in foreign languages as a demonstration of the power associated with the baptism of the Holy Spirit, instead of rejoicing in their ability to witness these events firsthand, some people said mockingly in Acts 2.13, they are full of new wine. I read in Acts chapter 6, verse 9 and 13, Then there arose some from what is called the synagogue of the freedmen, who set up false witnesses who said of Stephen, This man does not cease to speak blasphemous words against this holy place and the law. And then we find in Acts 14, verse 2, But the unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles and poisoned their minds against the brethren. Acts 16, 20, And the masters of the slave girl from whom Paul and Silas cast out a spirit of divination, brought them to the magistrates and said, These men, being Jews, exceedingly trouble our city. They teach customs which are not lawful for us, being Romans, to receive or observe. Further verbal arrows are slung against Christians in Acts 17, verses 6 and 7. Jews of Thessalonica dragged Jason and some brethren to the rulers of the city, crying out, These who have turned the world upside down have come here too. Jason has harbored them, and these are all acting contrary to the decrees of Caesar, saying there is another king, Jesus. Amidst a group of pagan skeptics, the scriptures inform us in Acts 17, verse 19 and 20, Epicurean and Stoic philosophers took Paul and brought him to the Areopagus, saying, May we know what this new doctrine is of which you speak? Are you bringing some strange things to our ears? When they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked. Men resorted to slander in Acts chapter 18, verse 12. When Gallio was proconsul of Achaia, the Jews of one accord rose up against Paul and brought him to the judgment seat, saying, This fellow persuades men to worship God contrary to the law. We find it said of the Apostle Paul in Acts 19, verse 18, verse 8, And he went into the synagogue and spoke boldly for three months, reasoning and persuading concerning the things of the kingdom of God. But when some were hardened and did not believe, but spoke evil of the way before the multitude, he departed from them and withdrew the disciples, reasoning daily in the school of Tyrannus. Further words of disdain against the apostle are found in Acts 21, verse 27. Jews from Asia, seeing him in the temple, stirred up the whole crowd and laid hands on him, crying, Men of Israel, help! This is the man who teaches all men everywhere against the people, the law, and this place. And furthermore, he also brought Greeks into the temple and has defiled this holy place. Well, now notice the language in Acts 24, beginning with verse 1. Now, after five days, Ananias, the high priest, came down with the elders and a certain orator named Tertullus. These gave evidence to the governor against Paul. And when he was called upon, Tertullus said, We have found this man a plague, a creator of dissension among all the Jews throughout the world, throughout the world, and a ringleader of the sect of the Nazarenes. He even tried to profane the temple. And the Jews also was scented, maintaining that these things were so. Acts 24, verse 12. And they neither found me in the temple, disputing with anyone nor inciting the crowd, either in the synagogues or in the city. Nor can they prove the things of which they now accuse me. But this I confess to you, that according to the way which they call a sect, So I worship the God of my fathers, believing all things which are written in the law and the prophets. I have hope in God, which they themselves also accept, that there will be a resurrection of the dead, both of the just and of the unjust. This being so, I myself always strive to have a conscience without offense toward God and men. Next, we find the Apostle Paul defending himself, um, against unsustainable accusations before Festus in Acts 25, verses 7 and 8. When he had come 
The Jews who had come down from Jerusalem stood about and laid many serious complaints against Paul, which they could not prove. While he answered for himself, neither against the law of the Jews nor against the temple nor against Caesar have I offended in anything at all. When the apostle Paul makes his defense before Agrippa in Acts 26, verse 24, Festus rebukes him saying, Paul, you're beside yourself. Much learning is driving you mad. Finally, when Paul called the leaders of the Jews together in Rome to defend himself against the expected accusations of the Jews in Jerusalem, the Jews in Rome said they had not heard the criticisms of the Jerusalem Jews against Paul. They added, however, in Acts 28, verse 22, but we desire to hear from you what you think. For concerning this sect, he's talking about Christianity, we know that it is spoken against everywhere. Certainly, if the first century Christians were unfairly maligned, it's unreasonable to expect that we will escape unfair misrepresentations for simply living the Christian life today. But what are some of the common myths that are circulated about Christianity? Well, number one, some people suggest Christians think they're better than everyone else. Not a genuine Christian. Certainly there are professing Christians who are either unaware of the spirit of Christianity or are immature in the faith that may have this attitude. But those who know and live according to the New Testament certainly do not feel this way. In fact, the only way one can become a Christian is if he acknowledges that he has sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, Romans 3, 23, and that his sin is personally responsible for Jesus' death on the cross, Romans 5, verse 8. Furthermore, Christians familiar with Jesus' teaching in Matthew 18, verse 21 through 33, understand better than anyone else how tremendous is their personal debt to God because of their sin. The Apostle Paul provides a powerful example of this spirit when he speaks of himself as the chief of sinners. In 2 Timothy 2, 2 Timothy 1, verse 15. Number two, unbelievers circulate the myth sometimes that Christians are uneducated and ignorant. One form of this misrepresentation is that Christians reject science or at least accept ideas contrary to the evidence. It's common for unbelievers of different stripes to say, Christians reject what science says. Dallas Willard points out in the book, The Wedge of Truth, Splitting the Foundations of Naturalism, co-authored with Dennis E. Johnson, quote, unfortunately, science says nothing. It is not the kind of thing that can say anything. Only scientists say things, and scientists can be remarkably unscientific and are often remarkably wrong. In addition, many who would speak for science are not scientists and have no qualifications in the area of their claims, end quote. It's true that the common people heard Jesus gladly, Mark 12, 37. It's also true, as the Spirit tells us in 1 Corinthians 1, verse 26, not many wise men, according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise. God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things which are mighty. And yet some of the most brilliant men, including scientists, have been believers in God, Jesus, and the scriptures. In Henry M. Morris's book, Men of Science, Men of God, great scientists who believe the Bible. The author presents biographies of brilliant minds, including the founders of a number of scientific disciplines. His list includes men like Leonardo da Vinci, Copernicus, Galileo, Johann Kepler, Francis Bacon, Blaise Pascal, Robert Boyle, William Harvey, Tycho Brahe, Isaac Newton, Michael Faraday, Matthew Murray, James Jewell, Gregor Mendel, Louis Pasteur, Lord Kelvin, George Lister, George Washington Garver, and many more. Some of the most brilliant men who have ever lived and are alive today profess allegiance to Jesus Christ. Oh no, the difficulty is not with science. 
But as the Spirit inspires Timothy to say in 1 Timothy 6, verse 20 in the King James Version, science falsely so-called. As we've noticed at length in other messages, the Bible was centuries and even millennia ahead of the secular crowd in noting scientific and medical facts. Number three, another common myth about Christians is that they are not able to enjoy life because their faith deprives them of experiencing many pleasures. This usually includes behaviors they usually refer to like uh, drinking alcohol socially or recreationally, engaging in premarital or extramarital sex, sleeping in, going fishing or golfing instead of going to church on the Lord's Day. Now, while many may see these as disadvantages that hamper the potential for a fulfilling life, a closer look shows that these activities associated with Christianity actually lead to the abundant life Jesus promised in John 10, verse 10. By avoiding casual and considerable consumption of alcohol, the Christian avoids being among the 88,000 deaths annually attributed to excessive alcohol use and the 17,000 people a year who die as a result of traffic accidents that involve drinking. Almost 40% of all fatal traffic accidents in the U.S. involve alcohol, according to the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration. That's certainly not the kind of so-called fun that we'll be glad not to experience. Sober living prevents us from being numbered with the 17.6 million people, one of every 12 adults who suffer from alcohol abuse or dependence, along with several million more who engage in risky binge drinking patterns that often lead to many other serious problems. The risks include, in part, dementia, stroke, neuropathy, cardiovascular problems, including myocardial infarction, cardiomyopathy, atrial fibrillation, and hypertension, psychiatric problems, including depression, anxiety, and suicide, social problems, including unemployment, lost productivity, family problems, violence, including child maltreatment, fights, and homicides, unintentional injuries, such as motor vehicle traffic crashes, falls, drowning, burns, and firearm injuries, increased risk for many kinds of cancers, including liver, mouth, throat, larynx, and esophagus. Liver diseases, including fatty liver, alcoholic hepatitis, cirrhosis, gastrointestinal problems, including pancreatitis and gastritis. Who would consider those outcomes part of the good life? Clean, sober living of Christianity leads to the truly meaningful, enjoyable life. Of course, we see similar problems with unbridled and biblically forbidden sexual activity. While the Bible acknowledges the pleasures of sin, Hebrews 11, 24 through 26, the scriptures also point out how fleeting those pleasures are. After men and women experience the fleeting physical fulfillment of pornography, premarital and extramarital sex, then what? The fruit of such behaviors include STDs, unwanted pregnancy, impotency, insecurity, marital instability, divorce, and often premature death. In no arena are the Spirit's words in 2 Peter 2, 19 more applicable than in associations with promiscuity. He says, while they promise them liberty, freedom, they themselves are slaves of corruption. For by whom a person is overcome, by him also he is brought into bondage, in chains, the chains of sin. And what about the great advantage extolled by the non-Christian in, as he would say, getting to make the most out of his Sunday by doing something besides attending church services? Turns out this claim is exaggerated as well. May 16th, 2016 CNN article by Karina Storrs presents evidence that churchgoers live longer in addition to living better than non-churchgoers. Storrs tells us in the article, titled Going to Church Could Help You Live Longer, that researchers looked at data on nearly 75,000 middle-aged female nurses in the United States as part of the Nurses Health Study. The participants answered questions about whether they attended religious services regularly. 
every four years between 1992 and 2012, and about other aspects of their lives over the years. The researchers found that women who went to church more than once a week had a 33% lower risk of dying during the study period compared with those who said they never went. That's substantial. Less frequent attendance was also associated with a lower risk of death as women who attended once a week or less than weekly had 26% and 13% lower risk of death respectively. Women who regularly attended religious services also had higher rates of social support and optimism, had lower rates of depression, and were less likely to smoke. Dr. Dan German Blazer II, professor of psychiatry and behavioral sciences at Duke University Medical Center, addressed the new study in the same issue of the Journal of the American Medical Association. He said, the one aspect that is significantly more predictive of good health, more than prayer and Bible study, is about religious service attendance. That's CNN.com. Well, we hope this morning you've been enlightened on a number of the more common myths circulated about Christianity. And we hope that you'll stay with us next week as we present a message titled, Debunking Myths About the Church of Christ. There's a lot of things that are said specifically about the Church of Christ that are simply not true. Well, stay with us and after our song so you can hear how you can get a free copy of this message. There was no price I could pay to cancel my sin that had washed every stain. There was nothing I could do to buy shine through, shine through, shine through. He paid all upon the cross. No longer felt my sin or with the eternal loss. He took my sin, washed it away. When I was immersed in that watery grave, I heard that gospel call me, cause he paid it all. I could not pay for my sin, for though he were God and saved for all men, helpless was I to provide, but then he died, he died, he died, he paid it all upon the cross. No longer found my sin, for with eternal loss he took my sin, washed it away. When I was immersed in that watery grave, I heard that gospel call me, cause he paid it all. There was a God and all, where sin could not vanish but merely be rolled. Better is our sacrifice, he paid the great price of Christ. He paid it all upon the cross. No longer felt my sin, for with eternal loss he took my sin, washed it away. When I was immersed in that watery grave, I heard that gospel call me, cause he paid Thank you for watching Let the Bible Speak. We hope you've been enjoying our series, debunking myths about Bible-related topics. We hope that you've heard today God speaking to you from His inspired Word. We hope that you will visit our website, letthebiblespeak.com, where you can watch videos, hear audio, and read transcripts of the program at your convenience. You also have the opportunity, if you 
use apps on your iPhone, you can uh, add the Let the Bible Speak app and quickly um, search different subjects and topics and watch the program that way. We hope you watch Let the Bible Speak every Lord's Day. And we also hope you'll join us for worship at one of the congregations listed shortly. Uh, we want you to understand that uh, the problem, the program has never been intended to substitute for the assembly of the church. In Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24 and, and verse 25, we are commanded to assemble and to forsake the assembling of ourselves together is a violation of God's word. And when we do that, of course, we come together into one place. 1 Corinthians 11 and 1 Corinthians 14. You can call or write for a copy of number 1395, Debunking Myths About Christianity. We hope you'll set your DVR so you never miss an episode of Let the Bible Speak. You can request also for free the Truth Freeze Bible course, and we also encourage you to check out studythebibleyourself.com for an online tutorial that will allow you to expand your Bible study capacity, whether you're a beginning, intermediate, or advanced Bible student. We, hope, we close with the words of the Apostle Paul from Romans 16, verse 16. This is our sentiment. The churches of Christ salute you. Until next week, goodbye, and may God bless you. We hope you've been challenged and encouraged by Bible teaching. We strive to speak the truth in love and aspire to help you make heaven your home. I have dear friends among congregations in your area committed to worshiping in spirit and in truth, John 4, verse 24. Know that when you visit, you will not be singled out or embarrassed, but will receive a warm welcome from caring Christians. Jesus says, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. We hope by God's providence to be an avenue through which you more fully live out the will of God. My dear friends near you are knowledgeable and approachable Bible teachers. They would gladly meet with you to discuss the scriptures with an open Bible. Life is short, so short. James 4.14 says, Our life is like a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. We hope you see the urgency in doing all you can as soon as you can to make sure your life is right with God. Get the Let the Bible Speak app and visit letthebiblespeak.com for a wealth of biblical teaching. Call, text, or email, and we'll personally return each message you send to us.